So hello everybody and welcome to the webinar that's live. Uh, the topic of discussion today is crypto assets in the current sanctions environment. My name is Sandy Gill and I'm one of the associate directors at This Is Financial, which is a niche AML consultancy firm. Uh, today we've got um, a great number of panelists for you, very experienced in their respective fields. Um, and we're going to basically talk about crypto assets in the current sanctions environment. Uh, first off, we have Anne Maria Rothenstein. Anne Maria is an internationally experienced bilingual compliance executive, and she also works as a non executive director. And she's got three decades of experience and deep expertise in international capital markets and financial markets regulation and compliance. Welcome, Anne Maria, this morning. Morning, thank you. Next, we have Tom Griffiths. He's Chief Compliance Officer and MLRO at DigiVault. Uh, DigiVault was the first standalone digital asset custodian to be registered by the FCA as a crypto asset firm. He's been working within regulatory change and compliance since 2003, and is extremely knowledgeable in the crypto assets arena. Next, we have Gabriel Cosma, who's head of LISIS Financial. Gabriel's an industry recognized financial crime and compliance risk specialist, and he brings with him extensive leadership experience and has over 20 years of experience leading financial services institutions in an effort to deliver uh, effective compliance uh, solutions. So welcome, Tom and Gabriel. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Matthew Gardiner, who basically consults on new centers of gravity in finance. And he's basically worked with crypto institutions, exchanges, DEFI crypto exchanges, tier one banks, central banks, and global regulators on crypto asset strategy. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you, pleased to be here. Okay, thank you um, for taking your time this morning to join the webinar. So we're going to kick off. Um, so I'm just going to basically set the scene with what we're going to talk about today. So with the recent financial sanctions against Russia, uh, which have effectively excluded Russian banks from the global banking system, this in turn has put the spotlight on crypto assets and their role in the financial system going forwards, especially with regards to the third party payment systems, such as SWIFT, being out of reach for sanctioned individuals now. So I'm going to basically go around the panel and ask a number of questions in relation to the current sanctions environment with regards to crypto assets specifically. So over to Matt first. Matt, can you define crypto assets for us and where they fit into the global financial system, please? Sure. Well, at the moment, I guess, you know, bringing it down to basics, about 2% of global MG money supply is in crypto at the moment. So crypto assets are, uh, as we say, crypto assets. They are cryptography stored. Uh, we know Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example, is two big ones. There are many more now in the DeFi sphere as well. But they are digital assets with live encryption, essentially, um, which are, you know, now also moving into um, capital markets and also into institutional markets quite heavily. Yeah. Thank you. And Matt, can you explain why people refer to crypto as an asset and not a currency? It depends on the kind of legal definition of currency and also obviously the sometimes used as assets and actually the speed of transactions sometimes isn't sufficient for them to be used as a currency, but it's more of a legal definition and a methodological one. We have things like Solana Pay, which have now emerged, which are instant payment uh, via currency called Solana. But yeah, um, it's very much a technical definition and some method behind it. Okay, thanks for that. Um, over to Tom from DigiVault. Tom, there seems to be a school of thought 
that views crypto assets in a positive light. So can you highlight some of the positive aspects linked to crypto assets for us and why crypto assets can actually be useful in a sanctioned environment? Oh, yeah, sure. So, um, you know, many of these um, um, asset classes, um, these coins have been um, around for, you know, eight or nine years. And, you know, certainly in the um, early days, um, lots of these assets were involved in transactions to buy, you know, drugs and all sorts of, you know, awful things off the um, um, you know, actual dark web. Um, but since they've, they've actually gained, um, you know, a, a comparatively large market share um, and have been and are, you know entering um, regulation um, in the EU UK and you know, like more regions um, you know, like in the world they really are starting to to be seen as a in you know, like in a good light so um, you know, like as Matt kind of led on to um, every single transaction is is um, is on the chain it's um, recorded for um, evermore up until I'm not sure you know like I'm not a um, you know, digital you know, a blockchain expert but um, you know these are are all um, recorded um, and so it's it, it's it's very very easy to you know track and trace where these assets have gone to and through who and through where, um, through you know these these tools which have um, evolved, such as um, um, Elliptic over the past you know f four or five years. So it's it's actually very easy to actually trace who, who owns what and where. Um, so which actually makes them you know comparatively easy to seize under these these. Um, new and um, like ever evolving um, uh, sanctions. Thank you, Tom. So in relation to seizing uh, crypto assets, and Maria, a question for you, how has the sanctions regime affected, um, oh, sorry, what's the difference between seizure and ownership for, for crypto assets? Could you explain that to us, please? So it very much depends on where you are in the crypto um, environment world and what kind of model you have. So um, if the assets are with a custodian, um, then there is a greater likelihood of an ability, and depending on the, the legal contracts that have been signed, but it's a greater a possibility of, of seizure. However, if one is operating uh, in such a way that it's title transfer, that makes it much more complicated. Um, so when, when in fact title transfer, the coin becomes the property of the liquidity provider and the seller of the coin receives fiat or other coin in exchange for it. So that would be the differentiation. Okay, thank you, Anne-Maria. And over to um, Gabriel now. Gabriel, in your experience and from your, uh, you know, from your consulting experience, what practical changes do you think firms need to make uh, you know, due to the updated sanctions regimes. I think you're on mute, Gabriel. So the, yeah, thank you. Of course. Um, so, so the sanction regime has been uh, it's been there for for a for a long time, of course. But um, there's some the recent changes. Um, I think most of the firms, they expect to have already in place robust screening processes. So it's nothing new here. It's probably the difference is the extent of the sanction um, regimes um, are currently being imposed. And firms need to ensure the systems are effective. And probably what I would say is they might want to consider maybe independent reviews to test the effectiveness of the sanction screening processes and controls it has to be done by somebody who knows <laughs> how to test. And um, because obviously failures, they cost, they cost a lot uh, in terms of uh, penalties and, and potential exposure to uh, reputational risk. And they might want to consider looking at coverage. Is all relevant business covered by, by the sanction screening? Is that complete? Is, uh, do you have all the uh, relevant lists have been updated? Um, um, and uh, all the um, uh, and the customer payment screening uh, entities and individuals in the companies are all being screened. 
uh, an appropriate way. And then, of course, it comes the effectiveness. Can you identify the individuals at the matching criteria thresholds fit for purpose? And of course, the other thing is we might suggest as a firm to look at the risk appetite of the firm to understand, do I have to adjust the risk appetite to conform yeah, and, with the new reality? I agree with that. Uh, so, yeah. so in this, um, over this past, past month with these these um you know sanctions um evolving almost every day and um you know with the uk and the eu it was it was you know it was easier to um manage but um over the course of the, the, you know, the last month we've had um you know eu sanctions changing at a separate rate to the the uk and the uk at a separate rate and separate scope to ofac but um, I think um, your point about, about uh, the, the um, um, you know, assurance, although every time there's been a change, you know, me and my team have, have kind of undertaken checks, but, you know, the, the really dull, um, mundane stuff, which every firm ought to do on a annual basis, the auditing, um, the testing of these, these tools, the um, sampling each month, that, that really gave me, you know, absolute comfort that we are as a firm um, okay be because we know all these systems um, and operation um, operational controls work effectively yeah, thank, thank you tom thank you so touching so tom and gabriel touched on ofac and international sanctions so matt a question for you in your opinion do you think international sanctions have become more stringent in light of the war in Ukraine? Yeah, absolutely, undeniably, absolutely have. Um, obviously, the banking sector has a tough battle on its hands with them, but yeah, they have become more stringent. And just to add to the last point as well, in certain jurisdictions, including the US, not knowing that you are breaching sanctions uh, by onboarding a, a sanctioned individual is also not now a defence. It never really was, but certainly not mm -hmm. under these regimes. So certainly having extremely good analysis and extremely good onboarding procedures, very, very uh, thorough, um, is, is really necessary now. Um, it's, I think it's important and incumbent upon certainly CEOs and C-suite to ensure that the processes that they're using are stringent enough uh, and they can satisfy themselves that they know everything they possibly could about individuals before onboarding them. Yeah, I, know, I, I, I would say agree with that because um, I think it does start with that, that the, the very early journey, journey of having extremely robust onboarding procedures and the ongoing monitoring um, increasingly. And I think it's, you know, it, it, it is imperative these days to make sure that you do have very strong and, and, and the use of third party systems. Mm -hmm. So the onboarding, the screening, the ongoing monitoring, the transaction monitoring. And then of course, in, in light of what's happened over the past month, uh, updating your, your own um, compliance risk assessments using the various lists that are published and then taking the highest standard you can. Um, so th there's, yeah, I don't. It, it's slightly worrying that one, one has seen some some language around or rhetoric around. Oh, crypto is the potential way around it. I think crypto certainly is will be more. more uh, the crypto markets will be more stringent because they actually have the ability to analyze the transactions via the blockchain. Thank you, Anne Maria. So, a question for you, Gabriel. Do you think this might mobilize people to actually move their financial assets into the crypto asset environment? Well, I think um, I need to write a bit of Anne-Marie, Anne Maria's um, a comment earlier. And probably my answer is um, yes and no. It's a bit ambiguous answer, but um, yes, I think because where the sanction regime becomes more stringent, some people, entities might be willing and try and circumvent sanction regime by looking at transacting outside the regulated market. Uh, and of course, crypto asset is, sits somewhere in there. Um, but again, I think Anne-Maria's point earlier, uh, that's probably, that, that's, um, yeah, we, we need to, to debate it a bit more if, um, if that will uh, will actually help circumvent the sanctions or not. 
And now, because uh, crypto assets are not a good instrument really to facilitate volumes transactions, to my mind anyway, and payments. So um, if, if um, entities, for example, want to make a large amount of payments and so on, they need to use the, the, the classic instrument in a SWIFT transaction and so on for, for these payments. It's not really for crypto to basically facilitate that. Um, and of course, the, uh, that raises another thing, which is the concern, you know, because technology is still new, the understanding how technology works uh, by all, you know, not only by, by everybody is um, the crypto assets are increasingly being used to circumvent uh, sanctions. This is a, a concern and it comes from the market, comes from people who um, uh, will might uh, want to bring increased scrutiny on the crypto firms. So I think there's awareness around that. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to uh, ask the, uh, the rest of the audience what they think about um, this uh, last, especially this last. Yeah, sure. So uh, I think again with crypto, there's, um, you know, like everything like cash, there's, um, you know, the good and the bad with cash. It's easy to walk into a shop, um, you know, and use a note or some coins to you know, get your milk. It's, it's easy to pass it on to someone on the street or someone else. And the ease of passing on, you know, crypto assets um, at the moment is not there. Um, I think in, in the next three, four, five years, it will be. And I know that um, um, certain firms are um, like enabling pretty much the instant transfer um, um, of crypto through apps onto, onto payments. Um, but I also think there's the, the volume point, which you said about, about moving large sums of cash, certainly not there now. Um, it's a good thing. I also want to just cover two or three points really quickly about also why, you know, crypto in this current um, war, as it is, um, is good. Um, um, Ukrainian refugees are able to, to take out thousands, millions of, of pounds if they have it, um, 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 of crypto on their, their laptop or their YubiKey. Whilst if it was cash, it would be extremely hard and it could get, you know, robbed off them or, or, or seized at some, um, some, you know, checkpoint. Um, and, um, and yeah, I think, I think the, the, you know, the reputation it has as being used for laundering is just, is just not true. The, the largest ever, you know, cash seize, uh, seizure was done in, in, um, meth lab braids in Mexico and that was about 280 million pounds it was only last month which um, US law enforcement um, sees you know almost 15 times that in um, in in hacked um, um, assets so um, it's not all bad it is very much systems and controls it, it's 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 the same old boring thing from the tradfi it's having systems and controls and i take up on gabriel's point and on tom's point the vo the, the volumes aren't there um, to to facilitate the, you know, the the huge amounts of transfers um that the, the, the fears around. Yes, there are dangers, and, and Tom's talked about them, and, and there is a historical, um, slightly bad reputation from the time of the dark net. Um, but if um, legitimate operators are working uh, using public blockchains, it, that, that facilitates the blockchain analysis um, and facilitates tracing, um, the concerns would be obviously with things like privacy protected coins or decentralized exchanges. Thank you. And certainly say, sorry, uh, just you, to Matthew. kind of, apologies. And just to add to that, I think there is a lot of concern within the industry or a lot of movement towards making sure that it is fully compliant. And the very concern about reputational risk, as we know, being pointed out, the volumes aren't there to move certainly the, you know, the huge amounts of uh, <clears throat> dollars that are being sanctioned. But there is a move definitely to have more cohesion. We've got Carol House, Director of Cybersecurity and Secure Digital Innovation at the uh, White House National Security Summit, urging everybody to work more closely together. And that's her speaking in an industry forum in global digital finance, um, where you know, a lot of industry heads <clears throat> come together. So there certainly is an awareness of reputational risk and a big willingness to counter it and um, a move towards a more global regulatory consensus as well has been spurred by this. It's already 
well in existence and it's been spurred on even further. So on that point, Matt, with regards to global regulatory consensus, do you think, and a question to all panellists, do you think firms are ready for crypto asset registration and regulation? And do you think they currently have a clear understanding of what exactly is required in a regulated market? I think, sorry, I'll go first. I think, think um, regulation is key. Um, 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 it provides, you know, consumer with the um, um, actual protection they need. Um, it's it holds firms to account. Um, it increases um, um, actual standards, um, and it's and it's mainstream. You know, in um, the you know mid nineties, no one knew the actual full um, you know the full scope of the internet. Um, and if you move on you know, 10, 20 years since, no one then would ever have thought that the, the largest, um, most powerful companies in the world are, are online um, internet firms. So, so I, think, I think we are at a um, second dawn here um, of actually tech um, underlined by crypto assets. Um, and that includes all these stuff, which I guarantee in three years time, everyone will know what NFTs are and their true application. And to ensure that everything is controlled and you know to you know stop sanctions um, 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 individuals then regulation and oversight um, is absolutely fundamentally key it's a very interesting answer thank you tom and um, have any of the other panelists got anything to say on that point with regards to whether you think firms are ready for crypto asset regulation i think Sorry, Sorry. Go ahead, Matt. Emily, please. Yeah, so um, they have to be if you want to be. So as, as crypto comes, moves towards the, the, the TradFi space and, and is, is more frequently adopted and adopted by a huge proportion of the, the population of the world. Um, you know, if one to say, like, uh, I had a discussion about a year ago um, when there was talk about regulating spot crypto and and I played the devil's advocate and said, well, you know, don't regulate spot foreign exchange. Why would you regulate spot crypto? And the response was, well, Joe Public isn't selling his shirt to, to buy a spot foreign exchange, but the cleaning lady's now doing crypto. Um, it has a broad appeal, um, even though some people doesn't say, say it's not ESG. It's actually, it may not be quite E, but it's very SG. Mm -hmm. It um, brings financial services to a lot of people who wouldn't necessarily be able to operate in the TradFi space. And as the crypto space moves into the TradFi space with the use of derivatives, um, which is increasingly happening, um, reg regulation is key, it's fundamental, it's got to be there. Thank you, Anne-Maria. Gabriel? Yes, yeah, so I I'm, I'm, I'm fully agree uh, with Anne-Maria here is um, crypto firms, are they ready to operate in the regulated market? Some are, some, are not. Some are getting ready for that, trying to understand why what operating in a regulated market means. And of course, um, the unfortunate thing is comes with the cost. Is um, operating in a regulated market is um, it means there is a cost attached to it, but it's a cost worth paying to protect consumers with their customers. And it's a, um, it's, a, it's a price worth paying, a cost worth paying when you're thinking that you want to operate in an environment where it's safe for the consumer customer, for the companies themselves, for the people operating these uh, organizations in the management um, uh, teams, and also for the investors in these companies. And yeah, just to um, um, you know, add on that point and explore it more, um, we're here to, to actually talk about about um, um, sanctions, um, you know, um, and actual crypto assets. And you know, as all of us know, that it's not the regulator who who enforces uh, sanctions. It, it's um, um, you know government agencies. Um, but a key role of the regulators is to ensure that firms, you know, have systems and controls in place which which meet the which are, are effective in in sanctioned you know um management um and also control thank you tom um, and matt you work globally with crypto exchanges what's your view on this 
Yeah, <clears throat> again, excuse me, they have to be ready, as Anne-Marie says, really, and they are being, um, there's a very long dialogue and consultation with, you know, several regulators. We've just seen the SEC issue the executive order now in the US, which really brought a lot of clarity to this, and really rapid pace between 60 and 180 days for response, for, you know, from the 17 and more agencies which regulate uh, financial services in the US. So, yeah, it's now really matured. As I say, it's going beyond 2% of global MT money supply. So to operate, um, you, you have to be um, okay. aware and, and ready. Thank you, Matthew. Um, by the way, for um, everybody watching live, if you do want to send through any questions, please do use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and please do send through any questions you have and we'll keep an eye on those and we'll do our best to put those to the panel. In the meantime, um, a question for the panel. So we've been talking about firms getting used to being regulated and getting used to re regulations for crypto assets, et cetera, but there is, it's still quite in its infancy and some crypto firms are attracted to centers that aren't very strongly regulated. So is there a possibility that this unregulated environment will increase the, you know, the popularity of crypto assets by criminals? I can't take um, you know that again. I think um, you know we we have seen and are seeing that um, regulators all over the world um, are taking this very very seriously as they should. But again, um, you know, regulators don't enforce um, sanctions. You know, and um, and you know we are here again to talk 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 about sanctions and um, 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 and crypto. And I think you know a, 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 a Something I've seen over the past, you know, few weeks or months, and um, as was mentioned earlier, sanctions are old, sanctions aren't new, sanctions are fairly straightforward. You're either sanctioned or you're not. You can either deal with someone or you can't. And if it's a a individual who's sanctioned in a, a certain country, um, then law enforcement are able to seize their um, um, assets, houses, boats. We're seeing on the news um, every day. Um, but but um, law agencies um, also seize you know, actual crypto um, assets, and I can tell you through my experience, I've never you know seen a yacht being seized or a multi-million pound you know like house being seen. I've seen you know crypto, or I've seen seen the end results um, um, of crypto being seized, um, and I've seen how quickly that can go from you know a door being kicked down um a laptop being found or a yubi key being found and then you know those assets are are kept um you know and you know crypto assets are being seized all all over the world every day in millions of pounds worth and being stored safely um you know same day these yachts which are owned by these um, sanctioned um, um, oligarchs are just being moved into into ports and countries which aren't in the the um, um, sanctioned um, regime interesting thank you tom so there was actually an article in the new york times last week and it was headed up that russia could use crypto assets to blunt the force of us sanctions so what are your views on that so over to the panel Just picking up on the last point, so there has been phenomenal growth, I think 800% growth, according to some surveys, in retail investment activity uh, in crypto. There are now around 450 exchanges in 2019, there are around 250. So certainly a lot of growth. Um, but as we see with this kind of more coordinated uh, approach to sanctions with more global regulatory consensus, um, really bad actors will be much easier to identify. And there are also, you know, important um, tracing facilities like Chainalysis or Elliptic who uh, become very proficient in tracing uh, the provenance of assets. Uh, some institutions are getting into crypto and minting their own because they don't want to have uh, assets which have been uh, running through uh, undesirable locations. So there's a very, what I'm really saying is as the regulatory uh, movement gathers strength and, and capability and infrastructure, uh, any bad actors will be far easier to identify and, and, and weed out or, or isolate really. That's my answer to that. Thank you, Matthew. So Anne, Maria, Tom and Gabriel, 
Do you think Russia could use crypto assets to blunt the force of US sanctions? I don't think you can say 100% that they can't and they won't. But there are, as, as Matt said, and, and we talked about the third party providers, um, these assets are more traceable. The blockchain analysis facilitates that tracing. Um, there isn't the, 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 the volumes to um, affect huge transfers in the individual coins are not there. So you, you can't rule it out. Um, bad actors will always try and find a way around things. Um, there is the portability, um, you know, they can port it on their key or whatever, um, but th then, then the bad actors actually got to be able to affect the, 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 the translation um, to get their hard dollars. And I mean, I know from the TradFi space because I have, um, you know, worked with market participants in, who are uh, you know, who were in Russia. I, I know some of them who've, who've taken a, a refugee route themselves and, and explained that they, they didn't, um, they obviously had to leave the bank accounts, but fortunately they did, they, they had a bank account somewhere else, but um, they were fleeing the, the regime of, 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 of Putin um, and they knew they would be arrested because they were outspoken. So, you know, there's, a, there's the, 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 the yin and the yang of it, you can't rule it out. There will be people who will always manage to get around the systems, but the the um, the systems and controls and the sanctions, as Tom has said, have been around for a long time. They've just been ramped up. So, um, yeah, I I, I, th I think the blockchain analysis um, and the way that crypto this markets work uh, makes it much easier to to affect the sanctions. Thank you, Anne Maria. So, Tom and Gabriel, have you got anything further to add on that point about Russia potentially using crypto assets to, to lessen or blunt the force of the US sanctions and indeed the UK and EU sanctions? Yeah, I, I can add very quickly to this. Uh, again, it's, <laughs> the answer is yes and no. Um, uh, we, we kind of uh, touched uh, earlier. Um, yes, yeah, the, potentially there is. Practically, again, we talk about volumes, we talk about um, maybe the access to technology, the, I, I, the, the lots of, um, a lot of other um, areas that should be considered. Uh, again, it can be dismissed. The, the possibility, again, to Tom's point earlier, is very good. People can, you know, I need to run away from uh, from uh, Ukraine very quickly with my assets. It's very easy to to save, you know, and to make your assets safe uh, because they're so portable. But also being portable means people can walk away with assets from one place to another for completely different reasons, uh, and not still to keep them safe, but not because <laughs> those assets they've been uh, really. Um, um, you know, they are uh, actually legitimate kind of assets uh, in all cases. So I think, yes, it's yes and no. Um, it's gonna become the, um, the main way of circumventing sanctions. I do not think so. It's gonna become a way, circumvent sanction. Yes, people will try. Bad actors will always try. I think, yeah, to I can't. You know, um, um, anything which has got um, um, a value that can be, you know, a secondhand pair of shoes, gold, cash, a car, um, you know, can be exchanged by, you know, rogue people or, uh, you know, criminals. But but um, just looking at, you know, sanctions again um, and crypto, um, Iran has been heavily sanctioned since since the um, um, 1980s, I think. Um, and there's lots of um, you know, reports about um, Iran being a major crypto miner. And it does, it does undertake a lot of mining um, um, of crypto assets. But I saw um, a report earlier this year by um, Elliptic, which said the estimated annual uh, amount in USD, which Iran as a country mines, is something like 900 million pounds. Now, 900 million pounds or 
USD to anyone on this call, I'm sure it's a huge amount, but you know, to run a country, it's really not much at all. And then um, looking at Russia um, and mining, it will mine, but Russia is a huge country with lots of people with huge um, um, infrastructure, which has now been cut off from the West. And if it looks, you know, through its crypto, you know, gazed um, out east, um, it's China, um, and China have effectively banned, you know, crypto. So, will you know, crypto be used to to evade sanctions in part? But I think in a very, very small amount and of very limited impact to Russia and its people and its country. Thank you, Tom. So we've had Just some to, sorry. questions. Sorry, Matt, off to you. One final, I know everyone's speaking for some time, there's a lot to say, but just to uh, kind of cut that off, uh, Coinbase would be able to apply quite a high degree of discrimination around sanctioned individuals operating even in Russia. So they haven't closed their entire operation in Russia, you know, the last time I checked, but they were able to apply quite a discriminated uh, approach to sanctioned individuals in Russia. So, yeah, again, we're in a more sophisticated position. We have more uh, KYC, KYB. Um, so, as we see from Coinbase, they've been able to shut down appro accounts appropriately. I think we'll see more of that. Thank you, Matt. We've had some very interesting questions come through and uh, quite a long one in the chat from Alex Humphrey. So I'll just read the end of that out. Um, Alex is saying, I would suspect that SDNs, Russians and criminals alike, would be able to avoid scrutiny in this space and completely move away from fiat, therefore avoiding the need for an off-ramp transaction and risks which that poses. Could basically, he's, what he's asking is, could we potentially see a darker side uh, to crypto start forming um, following the implementation of the sanctions? Mr. Gentleman, talking about DeFi, essentially. Right, so is DeFi going to enable because it's not such a heavily regulated sector as yet? Um, yes, but well, certainly seeing a move towards regulation of DeFi. I know of one regulated DeFi exchange in Europe. I read about another one this morning, which is uh, applying for licenses in uh, Abu Dhabi and, and Switzerland uh, and the US. You know, as we move towards you know, spot crypto ETF, that kind of piece where we begin to see you know more dematerialization in the markets and use of DeFi in financial markets, um, I think we'll see, we'll, we will definitely see more regulation. So um, again, I think it comes back down to uh, getting off ramping into hard dollars. That's when everyone is really caught out. Um, and there's a high degree of um, traceability through third party providers. So there's already that. And going forward as well, we're going to see a far more stringent attitude towards regulation of DeFi by regulators. So um, maybe a little at the moment, but certainly not in the future. Thank you, Matt. Um, so we have a question from Joel Skipper. Thank you, Joel, for your question. Thank you, by the way, Alex, for your question in the chat. Joel is asking the panel, do you envisage a global unified regulatory body for crypto in the next 10 to 15 years? I think that's an excellent question. Over to the panel. I'll take this um, at the start. And um, in short, I think yes and no. Um, I think, that, again, that um, most of us on this call know that the, um, you know, um, the actual G20, um, you know, um, their AML regulations are, are, you know, aligned to most points. And again, across the, the EU are and the UK. Um, so I think, in short, there will be, um, across the you know, G20 and those who want to join it. Um, and I think that every other country, as we see out in, in um, um, Nigeria, which is, is a known hub for money laundering and fraud, if you actually look at their regulations and the um, legislative's um, aim, they want to comply as um, or, or to regulate and enforce as the um, EU does. Thank you, Tom. Does anybody else like to help answer that question? Yeah, I, cer I certainly think there will be a cohesive approach as you have in TradFi and, and, and you know, post the crash we had in 2008 and um, the, the moves to have some, some, to have frameworks in geographic areas 
which are to a certain extent aligned with the same kind of objectives, but not identical. Um, so I, I, th I think there, there certainly will be more moves towards harmonization. I'm, I, I think there will be some form of overarching regulatory interface. Um, so th that would certainly tie in with what uh, Tom is talking about. There, there are already moves. We see people wanting to, uh, people adopting the FATF um, guidelines. So whether we have a, a global regulator, I think we'll have some form of overarching um, framework and we'll have the geographic regulators um, working closely together. Thank you, you know, Anna Maria. I'd say that's been evolving for some time as well as an ongoing conversation with many regulators. IOSCO as well now looking into DeFi too, I know just the other day. So yes, we're, we're moving towards it. I think certainly a, a global uh, kind of reference point for crypto with, with any new technology, same with AI, uh, regulations evolve. And as Angela Merkel said before she left office, you know, one of our greatest challenges is to uh, translate all of our, um, all of the conventions and regulations we developed over centuries into the digital sphere. Uh, and that's certainly happening with crypto too. Mm. Well, that's well said, thank you, Matt. So we've got a question in from Julie Sefton. Thanks for your question, Julie. And she's asking the panel, do you think that crypto in Dubai will increase in volume given that many Russians have now moved there and Dubai are not supporting sanctions? Um, I'll have this again. Um, yes, I think, yes, I think, I think, um, um, you know, you know, crypto all over the world will increase and is increasing. Um, there's, um, you know, likes of uh, um, the UAE and um, Miami are, are being, you know, like, um, um, epicenters of huge, huge um, events, you know, um, related to, you know, crypto. Lots of that is all, like all the bright lights and fast cars, and it's it, it may not be a true um, um, yeah, reflection of the, you know, these as, as actual hubs, but yes, it will do. And um, you know, I think 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 the the UK um, has got to look at itself through the. 90s and you know um like early yeah this century where we openly welcomed um russians who we've um, you know, since sanctioned and kicked out Interesting and i'd say point. to that too uh, you know to mm. operate internationally obviously the the provenance needs to be guaranteed so if uh, if crypto or funds are coming through via crypto from sanctioned individuals from any jurisdiction uh, they won't be accepted or it will be illegal to accept them in any case so uh, sure you may be able to run board in in a certain jurisdiction and, and go somewhere with it i have doubts about that happening in in the uae certainly with the strength of aggm abu dhabi uh, global markets and their kind of international standing so you may be able to run board but where are you going to go with it is my question really um which mm. just kind of proves that uh, crypto has far less challenges than uh, track has in terms of sanctions and absolutely. I mean, th this this is all, you know, there are always means to circumvent, but you won't be able to do that with a great deal of volume. And if um, if there is a broker that will onboard a lot of these people in in um, in the Middle East, in, in, in Dubai, as Matt says, you know, it's the traceability. If, if you're looking at it but through elliptic or, or chain analysis, um, you can see everything is contained in that blockchain. You know, it can be three, four, five, six, ten hops down the line, um, as the knowledge is accumulated and addresses are identified. You can see where it's coming from. Gabriel, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so there's nothing new for uh, people entities to try to circumvent sanctions, and they're very quick to jump on, um, you know, areas or countries which are less cooperative. So this is a it's an old story, it really. It's nothing new. But again, um, to Matthews and Tom's and Anne Maria's point, um, we we we're dealing with something um, in addition to to, to 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 usual, you know, type of payments and and people, um, you know, trying to you know hide the assets and so on to circumvent sanction regimes. Um, and I think that that yes, um, I think the um, the, the, the way crypto assets are 
uh, designed probably wouldn't facilitate the same way um, um, uh, that kind of um, way of people trying to circumvent sanctions as they would with normal assets and normal or you know fiat kind of currencies and so on. Um, yeah, but there will be countries that will be more friendly, well, more friendly um, <laughs> in a, yeah, kind of more friendly with people who are um, trying to hide the assets, uh, as we've seen already, certain countries, or slower. Um, <clears throat> and probably they'll react at some point, and at that point, they'll move somewhere else where they would be able to, um, you know, hide the assets or circumvent the uh, sanction regime. And just to that point, sorry, I've been looking at my phone as we're speaking, I'm just keeping up with the news, I'm, I'm not absent-mindedly looking elsewhere, but um, just like I saw this morning in the FT, um, US has warned wealthy Russians against shifting assets to evade sanctions, and they say, we know you're trying to move to shell companies, to new associates, we're watching you, that was a statement from US regulators um, yesterday, so certainly they're watching crypto too in any jurisdiction, so it's going to be extremely hard yeah, to pull this off. And also, yeah, kind of this, you know, point of speed of of, um, of sanctions. I know the the news moves far, you know, far actually faster than the sanctions do. But you know, to to implement sanctions, you know, it's not a a overnight thing. So so the the news can talk about um, oligarchs who own you know property in London, but you know, trying to get the, the sanctions regime um, you know changed and implemented um it takes time but i've i've you know like in my kind of 18 19 years um experience um except during you know um evasions and you know like other wars certainly in the last five years i've not seen the sanctioned regime you know move at um, um such pace we've got a I'm question sorry, the, i'm sorry just to say the onus is definitely upon anybody who's accepting uh, any type of funding anyway, as, as we started out saying, the onus is on them to take every step to ensure that they, they, the source is clean. Indeed. So we have a question from David Young. We may have touched on this um, already, but let's ask it to the panel. Are there, do you see any parallels or lessons to be learned from, the, from Iran's use of crypto assets to circumvent sanctions? I say to that, um, you know, as I said earlier, we're in a far more stringent environment. It's a far more mature uh, field that we're operating in with, you know, much higher degree of authentication. So, um, yeah, the lesson to be learned, I think that would be around authentication, around, you know, regulators and industry really taking it seriously. It's not long since uh, Jamie Dimon, for example, dismissed Bitcoin. Now, you know, JPM are invested in it. So perhaps a lesson to learn, learn would be to be ahead of the trend. Uh, and, and to uh, well, to be ahead of trend, and I think we are already there in many ways. Yeah, and again, just to kind of add to my point, um, um, Iran, you know, sanctions, you know, for years, um, it's it's using mining as a way to obtain um, um, assets which they can sell or try to to sell, but with limited um, 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 success. I think, you know, mining, you know, is is um, energy. Like it needs high amount of 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 um, um, energy, and I think Russia has got more natural resource to have more energy. Therefore, it can mine more than um, Iran has. But I don't think it'll have much of a um, um, impact on on yeah, the actual Russian infrastructure and um, you know actual people out there. Thanks, Tom. So we have time for one last question. It's from Joel Skipper. He says, you mentioned a difficulty in large transaction volume. In the push towards universalism, do you think XRP will resolve this issue and be more widely adopted? I think um, Matt will, um, yeah, of course, wants to actually um, um, answer this. Um, XRP is a um, like high, you know, high volume payment um, you know, chain. So, Yes, I think it will do. I think as it works through its issues with the SEC, um, it will it will start to come. It will be a leading you know chain into 
you know, using crypto payments, uh, uh, crypto assets for payments, and it is at the moment um, available on, on certain exchanges. Um, the likes of um, um, Solana, which Matt mentioned at the you know um, opening of this this um, meeting, um, it can it can actually process more more payments per second than Visa and um, Mastercard. So yes, in short, I think it will do. Matt, keen on on um, yeah your on this. yeah who knows who knows XRP has been around for a while, so perhaps it will make it, perhaps it won't. But there's, there's a lot of innovation in this sector. You know, as as we see in any space, when perhaps when we get towards spot ETF as well, when the reward is there, then solutions emerge. So um, who knows? That's the interesting part, really. What I'm assured by is really the stronger um, sanctions regime and, and stronger ability to um, to uh, apply sanctions to crypto. So if XLP or any other chain becomes really fluent, um, we'll certainly have the mechanisms to ensure that sanctions are applied to it. And there are some issues to be worked through there to make sure that this is a fair and ethical process and it, it abides by the rule of law. But there are big industry bodies working on that too. Thank you, Matt. So any closing comments from anybody on the panel before we close the webinar today? No. Okay, that just leaves me to say thank you to Alex Humphrey, Julie Sefton, Joel Skipper and David Young for your questions and comments. Thank you to all of our participants for joining today and an especially big thank you to Anne-Maria, Tom, Gabriel and Matt, our panellists. That's been a, a very knowledgeable and interesting discussion. So thank you very much for taking your time to join this live webinar today. And also a special thanks to Marnie from LISIS for organising the webinar and setting everything up today. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you to all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.